So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Now here's a shocking statistic. A new case of dementia is diagnosed every three seconds. Whoops, there goes another case right now. So it's estimated that over 50 million people worldwide are struggling with some form of dementia, a number that's expected to rise to 82 million people by 2030. And quite frankly, that's right around the corner. In fact, I bet you know someone who has struggled with dementia themselves, uh, either who has already passed or is currently struggling with dementia. Now, it hasn't received much press, but there is something that might be a major breakthrough in our understanding the causes and prevention of dementia. And today, I'll be chatting with one of the researchers behind this breakthrough, Dr. Dan Goodenough. Dr. Goodenow is the founder and CEO of Prodrome Sciences and has spent the past 30 years researching the biochemical signs of aging and disease and what can lead and prevent dementia. On today's episode, he and I are going to discuss his exciting new research into the causes of dementia, what your blood can tell you about your risk for dementia and Alzheimer's, and why we might just unlock the secrets of how the brain ages sooner than you think. Dr. Goodenow, welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Dr. Gundry. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm, I'm really excited to have you on this show uh, because uh, what you've been researching has been a, a kind of a pet project of, of mine for the last couple years when I first was, uh, was introduced to these compounds. But uh, I must say that ever since I learned about plasmalogens, I just can't say enough about how important they are and how little anybody talks about them. So why don't we start, um, give us a, a little behind the scenes look. You've been doing this for 30 years how did you get to prodrome sciences and where are we going? Well, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, it's um, the story about plasmalogens is actually really an interesting one on many levels. It's an interesting one in terms of just the medical community, but also how science works from beginning to end. And it's a really nice story. It's, it's like a detective story where you're following one clue after another to try to find the, the culprit in the crime here of dementia. And plasmalogens are one of those interesting molecules where they're, they're fossil lipids, so they're part of all the membranes of the body. Um, they're not new. We discovered them about 100 years ago. And we've known about them for a long time. They're, they're, we know about their importance. So children who are born with genetic mutations that impair their ability to make plasmalogens have extremely high mortality. Very few of them live to age 10. And depending upon the severity of the plasmalogen deficiency, um, it affects their lifespan. So we know that it's an obligate molecule for the human body. And we know that, say, infants that are born prematurely, some of those infants will have what's called bronchial dysplasia, which is basically driven by low levels of plasmalogens. And so the importance of plasmalogens have been known for a long time. And where they are made have also been known for a long time in a special organelle called the peroxisome. But we just really kind of ignore them because for most of our life, we make enough of them. And we don't, it's not a small amount in your blood. 20% of your entire brain lipid volume are plasmalogens. 35% of your heart, your lung, your kidney, your eye function. So we're not dealing with some very esoteric micromolecule that's just found you know, from someone's super high microscope in the human body. We're dealing with something that's quite obligate to human life. And it kind well, of- let, let me stop you right there for a second. And let me go back for a second because um, some of our listeners will say, well, now wait a minute, what the heck is a phospholipid? And okay, a plasmalogen is a phospholipid, but that, that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it, so why don't we start there? So the best way to think about phospholipids is to think about the human body. The human body has about a trillion cells. It's a lot of little individual three-dimensional spheres, if you will. And you can think of the human body like a very large, massive apartment building. And every one of the individual apartments 
are separated from other apartments by the walls in our apartment building. And then we also have, and those are usually the heavy st structural walls that separate one apartment from another apartment. But then there's rooms within the apartment, how we compartmentalize, how we do things in the kitchen and in the bedroom and in the bathroom, and we keep things separate. And your body compartmentalizes its activities that way. And what the body uses to make all these walls are called fossilates. And that's the biological material that basically gives the human body its physical structure. So a fossil lipid is like a soap that you use for dish soap. It has a polar head group that likes water, so it makes the, uses all the water, and has a non-polar or lipid-like molecule um, that goes into the oil side. It's like having oil and vinegar, right? And you, you can get them blended. And what happens is fossil lipids create what's called a fossil lipid bilayer, in that the non-polar group of one attaches to the non-polar group of another, and the polar head group stay on the outside. And so that's how the body creates what's basically a biological wall. And then that is that by bi those biological walls is how the body compartmentalizes all its activities. And so, of course, things have to go in and out of these walls, just like in your house. You have doors and you have windows and you have electrical outlets that connect one cell to another cell. And you can imagine if your walls of your house just started to shrink, all of a sudden your doors wouldn't open properly, or they'd stick open, or they wouldn't close properly, they'd stay open a little bit, and they would leak air. And so that's kind of where the physical structure of the human body comes in. And a lot of these fossil lipids, all of the building blocks of these fossil lipids we get in our diet, like the cholines and the ethanolines and our essential fatty acids that we get from our different oils. Um, plasmalogens are unique in that virtually 100% of the plasmalogens in your body, your body must make itself. And that's what gives it a very, it's kind of the most interesting planned obsolescence. It's like building a wonderful washing machine and just intentionally putting a weak belt in there knowing that, you know, it'll work for 20 years, but sooner or later that belt's going to fail. And that's kind of the peroxisome in the human body. So your body has, the nice thing about plasmalogens is it requires no dietary requirement. You can make plasmalogens from the simplest fat molecules on the planet. So you don't need an omega-3, you don't need an omega-6 or an omega-9. So you, your body... Plasmalogens are so important to the body that it doesn't require any dietary nutrient. But that is also its Achilles heel. Because since it doesn't require any dietary nutrients, you actually can't get it from your diet. You have to make it. So as we get older, and as the population gets older, we start seeing peroxisomal failure from liver damage, from, and it's very well reproduced in many, many studies. And so our ability to make plasmalogens starts to decrease with time. And of course, it doesn't decrease gradually. Some people have great peroxidal function until they're 100 years old, and some people start failing in their 50s and 30s. And so we have those types of discrepancies. Um, and you know, when you talk about science, people like to show these nice, beautiful graphs of how this molecule decreases with age. But that doesn't actually, have, that's not how it happens for individuals that you meet. Like most people will have normal levels for quite some time then something will happen, and then it'll drop off, and then they'll have low levels. And then when we average all the people together, it gives a nice, beautiful-looking graph on a piece of paper, but that's not really what happens to individuals at human beings. So what happens, we make those graphs go down, it's the number of people who become deficient increases. So say when you're 50, it's maybe only 5 or 10% of people have low levels. Then you're 60, 16, you know, 15 to 20, and then 30 percent. So, the people with good normal levels have the same. They have the same lo levels in their 90s that they had when they were 30. So they have no change. But the number of people with low levels starts to increase, and that brings the whole average down. And then, when geeky scientists like us make graphs, it makes it look like everybody's plasmalgin levels decrease a little bit every year, and that's really not how it happens. So that's the kind of interest. So that's what plasmalgins are. And what's really interesting, what gives them their special powers is a special bond called this vinyl ether bond. And that's what gives it its antioxidant capabilities. Like it's a massive free radical scavenger in the body. But it's also that vinyl ether bond is what gives memory infusion. So the release of neurotransmitters in the brain, which is why they're highly correlated to cognitive function. And it affects protein function in the membranes. So it changes the fluidity of your membranes so that the proteins 
um, do the appropriate work. So that's the thing. And so that, and that special bond, that vinyl leather bond, unfortunately, is very sensitive to acids. So when you, since our body has lots of plants management, you think if you eat a nice juicy steak or you, you know, animal products, that you should be eating plants management. But that finally the bond is sensitive to acids. And so when it hits your stomach acids, which is basically concentrated hydrochloric acid in your stomach, um, it breaks that bond down. So, so dietary sources of plasmalogens are, you know, minimally bioavailable. So that's the, so that's the, that's the phospholipid part of the story. Okay. So. Uh, we make them, if we're lucky enough, we make them all our lives. Uh, so what, is this, what does this have to do with dementia? Because obviously plasmalogens are needed in our brain. Uh, yeah. for, so keep with this detective story. Yeah, of. so this is where it gets really exciting. So back in the 90s, we had this whole genomics revolution, right? The whole scientific method was changing. People were starting to say, you know what? If the normal scientific method was you have a hypothesis, you say, you know what, I want to test this hypothesis, and I'm going to design an experiment to prove or disprove my idea, right? And so you you presuppose a question to answer. But in the genomics revolution, when we started sequencing the human genome, people said, well, we don't know what all these genes do. Let's just sequence all of them, right? And let's, let's, let's do large-scale or big data type research, measure everything, and then it became called hypothesis creating in that we would generate the data first and then from that data try to understand what's going on. And that changed the scientific method for the first time in you know, a millennium. And, but that happened for the genetic system. Biochemistry, so my background is a synthetic organic chemist and my PhD is in psychiatric medicine, looking at the biochemical mechanisms of psychiatric disease, so neurochemistry, um, how neurons and how cellular systems in the brain interact with each other. And so at the biochemical level, we didn't have that kind of technology. We couldn't measure all the small molecules, like all your neurotransmitters and all the, all the stuff we get from our environment. And so I had to stop a little bit from my research and become a bit of a tool maker. So I invented this technology called non-targeted metabolomics, which allowed us to measure thousands and thousands of small molecules in any kind of biological metric, you know, human blood, for example. And that allowed us for the first time to measure thousands and thousands of things without any knowledge beforehand. So I didn't go looking for plasmalogens. Plasmalogens came looking for me. That's where the story got interesting. So when we did this study on humans with different levels of cognitive impairment, and we measured it using this technology, we measured thousands of molecules in the blood, a whole bunch of these molecules that had this very strange molecular formula were decreased in individuals with, with um, dementia. And the level of their decrease correlated with the severity of the cognitive impairment. And I didn't even know what these molecules were at the time. I thought I hadn't seen these things. And so literally I Googled this back in the early 2000s and this plasmalogen molecule popped up. Because like I said, we've known about them for hundred years. And I'm going, what the heck is this going on, right? And so then there's like 30 or so of them in your blood. There's not just one. And um, so then that's step one. So, okay, so we see this association. Now, the question from an association is, is that association causative or is it just a bystander watching an accident on the freeway? Like, is, it, is it part of the accident or is it just a coincidence? And so you, so you go, wow, that's interesting. And so then you have to start studying more research. And then we find out that not only is it decreasing the blood, it's also decreasing the brain of individuals with Alzheimer's. And originally, people thought that was because as we get older, we get oxidative stress, and that was breaking down these molecules. But what my main contribution was, was that the discovery of this association in the blood, not in the brain, suggesting that actually we're dealing with a liver disease here more than a brain disease, that low levels of plasmalogens in the blood precede low levels of plasmalogens in the brain. And so that, of course, required much more research. And so we looked at people... You know, how far before dementia symptoms can we detect this in blood? And on average, about seven years, the decrease occurs about seven years before we see cognitive symptoms in humans. And we've done large, large clinical trials to, to reproduce this. 
And then you go one step further. You say, well, okay, that's interesting. So mechanistically, how? It's like, so now we've got this true association. It's kind of like the ego before genotype. We know it's real. We know there's an association. But we have to ask the question, so how is it acting? How is it that this observation is actually creating this phenotype that we can visually see that it's not mysterious that we see cognitive impairment going on? Cognitive ability is decreasing. And so then we start looking at more detail, and that's the, the, the correlation with membrane fusion, the release of neurotransmitters, and how they specifically relate to the cholinergic neuron system. So people that have Alzheimer's, anyone who has a family member, if you gets familiar with the drugs, the Aricept, that's a acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, and it's designed to increase acetylcholine. So we know for a fact, and we've known this since the late 70s, that the acetylcholine neurons are the neurons that get um, impaired, and their impairment is what causes dementia. So the cause of cognitive impairment has been known unambiguously for well over 30, 40 years. But that's not in question. The question becomes how and why, what are the, what are the reasons for those cholinergic neurons to, to lose their functionality? And, um, and then that's where the amyloid hypothesis comes in and so on. But amyloid, again, is a great biomarker, but it's not doing anything. It's, it shouldn't be there. So the observation that increased amyloid levels in the brain, the protein is what Alzheimer's is named for, um, is clearly shouldn't be there. The question is, why is it there? And so we studied the role of membranes, and we found that we could, if we increase the level of plasmalogens in the membranes, we reduced amyloid levels. We could actually turn amyloid formation on and off based upon the level of plasmalogens in the brain. And when we looked at human brain samples post-mortem, and we correlate, we found that people that had high plasmalogens in their brain had low levels of amyloid in the brain, and they had high levels of cognitive functioning. So they're in their cholinergic neuron system was in better shape. So we, so we have this one step at a time getting closer and closer to okay, this is not just smoke, this is fire. This is actually causative. And then we, the next step was to invent molecules that could, since I'm a chemist, I could design biochemical precursors. So we could then study, we could selectively increase different plasmalogens. Because the human brain has two main systems. It's your white matter system, which is the insulation part. It, it's, it protects all your neurons. And so people with multiple sclerosis or autism is kind of a white matter disease, right? And Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is a gray matter disease. That's the actual, that's the copper wire inside the, the insulation. The insulation, yeah. Right? And, and so those are different plasmalogens. So when people say, hey, I want omega-3s in my diet, those omega-3s are for the gray matter. For the wire on the inside, but your omega nines, your oleic acid, it protects the white matter. So they're very different. So they're different plasmalogens in the white matter than in the gray matter. So we we could selectively increase different plasmalogen levels and ask the question: What happens if I increase DHA or the long chain omega three? And when we do that, um, we improve uh, neurotransmission. We prevent Parkinson's. So if we treat animals with a plasmalogen precursor that has the omega-3 in it, we completely prevent Parkinson's, that we can't actually cause neurodegeneration. So, so animals that have a biochemical reserve of plasmalogens are protected against neurotoxins. And we do the same thing with multiple sclerosis studies. Animals that have a biochemical reserve of omega-9 plasmalogens are protected against demyelination, like multiple sclerosis. So now we can get really, we can get really into that cause and effect because we can say, okay, what happens if I, so if I create a situation where an animal has this biochemical reserve, are they or are they not protected against neurodegeneration? And the answer is unambiguously yes. So we can prove then that yes, biochemical reserves of plasmalogens are neuroprotective. And so now that's how the story kind of goes from um, from causation, from some an association with the disease, to actually being able to mechanistically identify the you know the the um, the causative mechanisms. So that's pretty exciting. 
And so we're now at the point where we can look at, um, and since this is the membrane structure issue, the Alzheimer's is really the canary in the coal mine. So we're seeing this generalized neurodegenerative stress on the human brain. And the question is, what is the weakest link in the brain? What, what part of the human brain is the most sensitive in the most people with this stress? And that turns out to be dementia. So when you see this plasmalgen reduction in, in humans, the most probable observation clinically will first be in decreased cognition. But it's also associated with increased risks of, of Parkinson's or stroke as well, that those happen in smaller percentages. So Alzheimer's is kind of that canary in the coal mine. It's, it's you know, obviously there's, there's, there is some variance in the human populations. We're not all the same, but um, when you look at large numbers of people, the most, the first thing that we observed is reduced cholinergic function. So sorry for being a bit wonky there. I hope to explain some of that chemistry. No, uh, yeah, yeah, this is this is good nerdy wonky stuff. Uh, so let's let's maybe pull it back to you know where the rubber meets the road. Um, you mentioned before that you know, we ma we make plasmalogens. We make them all the time, and I think I heard you say that they're they're primarily made in our liver. Um, and okay, so what's your hypothesis about why they stop being made in some people and other people, they're 100 years old and they're still making them? So I think it's a combination of luck and environment, okay? And probably there's some level of genetics that give people a little more resistance to it. So we know the liver toxicity issues with age. You know, we have, if you take a look at liver cancer rates over the last 20 years, they've doubled or more. So we have some serious environmental influences occurring in our human populations. So that's one thing. So clearly environmental. And people, as they get older, their mobility starts to decrease. So they start walking and exercising less. And your musculature, like your, your proxosomes, are stimulated by physical activity, specifically resistance training. So when we see clinical trials where resistance training has such powerful cognitive benefits, um, that's one of the reasons we see that. It's that if you resistance training, basically what resistance training does, it takes all of your peripheral muscles and kind of turns them into mini livers. It wakes them up and they start doing biochemical functions. Because your body is fundamentally lazy. Like you, you, your body is designed to do the least amount of work possible, right? So if I drop you in the middle of the desert, we want you to be able to walk across the desert, expending the least amount of energy. So we're balanced, our arms swing, our, our feet walk. So we're going to use our heart, we're going to use our lung for 95% of our activities. And so our, our biceps and our legs and different things, we kind of only use them intermittently, for instance. And so as you get older, we have all of this real estate in the human body to take advantage of. We can wake them up because they really haven't been overused in our lifetime. And so that's one aspect of getting them. So I think mobility, I think our diet, um, people eat less, you know, well when they, as they get older. And so it's a combination of factors, oxidative stress, our balance, our mitochondrial function. So those are the things. So I, like that's kind of my, I have a personal kind of pet peeve in the aging community in a sense, because I don't really believe in aging. We have reduced functionality. Aging is really an association. And so there's many things like this, you know, the human body survives for about 60 years in a majorly bulletproof. You know, from age one to 60, you pretty much have to step in front of a bus to die, statistically. Right? Like you just, like, so the systems are really quite robust and um, self, self regulating. And then we start losing certain functionalities. And so the loss of function is associated with age. It's not caused by age. And so I think you have these different, you know, different things, oxidative stress that happen. So that's the kind of thing. So where plasmalogens come in, um, I think people that have a healthy lifestyle, they limited, you know, drug pharmaceutical use. Um, and then they have a higher odds of being good. 
But what we have noticed, though, is that, so in the big university study in Rush, so Rush University in Chicago, their memory and aging and religious order study has been going on for well over 20 years. They track people. We had this huge longitudinal data set. And we looked at over 1,000 individuals, uh, 1,200 and some subjects. And we isolated people the top 10%. And it was just the top 10% that had 80% reduced um, likelihood of dementia over a six-year period. So I think we're almost dealing with a vitamin D situation with plasma allergens, in that normal levels for most of your life are fine. But just like vitamin D, even though it's theoretically possible to get enough vitamin D if you go out and you get in the sun and you, you know, you're a construction worker, but for most of us, it's almost impossible for us environmentally to get appropriate vitamin D levels. And I think we're gonna deal with the same situation for plasma allergens, where roughly only 10% of the population have naturally high protective levels. So, so the rest so, of us get supplemented. Okay, so that brings up two questions. Number one, uh, you know, early on you mentioned that you can certainly measure plasma allergen levels in the blood. Uh, Number one, can our listeners walk into their doctor's office or their healthcare provider and say, hi, I'd like my plasmalogen level measured. And of course, they're going to most likely be greeted with a blank stare. Correct. Um, uh, so let's answer that, but then, okay, let's find out about my plasmalogen levels. Oh, and they're low, what can I do about it? So, good question. So, first of all, yes, the plasmalgia testing is available to anyone in the United States or around the world, basically. And so, if your doctor isn't aware of it, they can get in contact with our laboratory and blood samples can be shipped and your plasmalgia levels can be measured. And we, would, and we don't measure just your plasmalgia levels. We measure your other fossil lipids. If your fossil choline levels, we look at your, your omega-3, omega-6 ratios, a bunch of other things here, methyltransferase. So we look at more of a holistic approach. Plasmalogens are a critical component of it, but we want to know if your proxisms are working or for why your plasmalogen levels are low so we can fix them. So that's number one. So yes, plasmalogen testing is available in a very simple and easy to understand way. Um, so people either program.com or drgoodnow.com, those will, will be linked up to people that can find that. And then in the supplement, being able to restore plasmalogens, that's been another big area of, of mine scientifically to understand that. So in our animal studies, we need around 10 milligrams per kilogram is roughly the dose, maybe a little bit less long term. Like I mentioned, you have a lot of plasmalogens in the blood. So the average human has about a gallon of blood in them, okay? Like it's quite a bit of blood, right? And the concentration of plasmalogens is roughly about a the total amount of plasmalogens in your blood supply may be about a gram, okay? And in your med, all your, and remember, your blood is just a, you know, a circulatory system, and all your membranes will have like a hundred times higher. So we're dealing with a significant amount of plasmalogens. And so 10 milligrams per kilogram is like half a gram to a gram um, is what you need for a therapeutic dose. So important is that, you know, you can't be driving a big semi-truck on the freeway and filling it up with a thimble full of gas, right? Like you, so you need to put enough gas in the tank to affect the plasmalgen levels. So the supplementation has to be sufficient enough at a dose that can actually effectively raise plasmalogens in the body. And so for that, you're going to need about 400 to uh, over 400 milligrams of plasmalgens per day. And so, and that's, I mean, to get that properly in a proper um, pure plasmalogen bioavailable form. That's where my expertise in chemistry and design work um, comes in. And that's what we've done over the last several years. And so we have a really nice 100% natural bioidentical plasmalogen precursor. Same concept as Aldova for Parkinson's. So in order to get to bypass this, this stomach digestion issue, okay, um, we designed a molecule that is two steps up in the biochemical pathway. Because it's the very last step that your liver makes that makes it unavailable by, in your diet. So we make a molecule that's just, it's a human molecule. It's your natural biochemical intermediate. It's just two steps up. So then you can eat it. It gets absorbed. And it actually goes not just to your liver, but it goes into all the cells of your body, into your brain and everything. So we can 
we can directly supplement every cell of the body. So that's kind of where, where you're at. And the nice thing about testing is that you don't have to take anyone's word for it, right? Like even if you start feeling the physiological effects, which many people do very quickly, um, when you get retested, you know, it's not, it's not black magic. Like you can want, you know, here's your blood levels before and here's your blood levels after and you can target the level that you, that you want to stay at, leave it there and then go on and live the rest of your life knowing that you have a, you know, a reserve capacity of tough analysis. So um, how, you talk about biochemical reserve. Um, so can you literally build up a reserve of plasmalogens? Yeah, or, yeah, that's the exciting part. And so this is really, you know, it's, this is the, the, the stuck on stupid part of my scientific career, right? We, 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 as scientists, we, we get so focused on the negative. So I do all these clinical trials. I invented this cool technology that could measure thousands of molecules, right? A bunch of patents in this space. And then we'd study cancers and neurodegenerative diseases, and we'd focus on the disease. Okay, what's wrong with the disease? Here's someone with a disease. What, you know, we, and everything is disease, 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 disease focused. You know, probably 30 different diseases I've studied and developed biochemical markers for those diseases and biochemical programs, which means how the body changes before the disease occurs. If you just don't walk down the street, get hit by lightning, and wake up the next morning with stage four colon cancer. But that just doesn't happen, right? There's something that happens beforehand that sets you up for that. And that's true, you measure that. But what I was missing over the 30 years of research was the other half of that coin, is that, yeah, I'm, I'm using normal people or healthy people as my other score of the football game, right? That you know, versus the losing side, which is the disease side. And I'm focusing on what's causing the disease side to be disease. And I was missing the most obvious is what was, what's, what's good about the winning side? Like, why are these people not getting diseases? And that's where the biochemical reserve concept comes in. So this concept of saying, let's look for disease, stop a disease, that only gets me back to zero, right? That only gets me back to baseline. And so we can now move from baseline to biochemical reserve to protective levels and to levels of, and the real fun part of this is how far can we push human longevity and vitality? No one's really thought about it in a biochemical reserve capacity perspective and say, you know what? We have these systems. We can project them on their downward trend. Let's move them upward to a biochemical reserve capacity. This is why we take vitamin D, for instance. So biochemical reserve isn't a new thing. You know, people don't take vitamin C to prevent scurvy anymore, right? Like, you don't take your vitamin D because you don't want to get rickets. Like, no one's getting those diseases. So, all of these vitamins, if you take n acetylcysteine or if you take any kind of other supplements for maintaining glutathione or your NAD program, so all of those concepts are biochemical reserve concepts. It's saying, you know what? I don't want to wait to become deficient. I want to make sure I have sufficient levels now and I don't need to wait for a negative symptom to come in and fix the problem. I already know enough. I don't, I don't need to wait for my car engine to run out of oil or gas before I fill it up. I have enough knowledge beforehand. So that's a concept of biochemical reserve. And can we do that in a systematic, scientific way? And more importantly, can we do it in a distributable way? This is the UPS FedEx problem, is how do you deliver that type of medicine to large groups of people, because you mentioned Alzheimer's. You know, you're talking 30% of the population here. And people don't realize that most people don't calculate in the survival bias in that equation. So when you talk 30% of 90-year-olds that have Alzheimer's disease or dementia, that's 30% of the healthiest of the healthiest of us who have actually made it to 90. That doesn't, that, that, that doesn't calculate all the people who had dementia before them. So the cumulative incidence rate of a 95-year-old is about 80%. So if you make it to age 95, okay, you've already been without dementia. You're only in that 20% of the population that didn't get dementia. So we're not dealing with the disease. In fact, the people who don't get dementia are the minority, cumulatively. And so that's, I think, where we're kind of exciting about I think dementia is going to be one of those diseases of humans 
that really allow us to think of medicine in a different way, um, and think of prevention in a different way, and optimization in a different way. And hopefully we can start eliminating, you know, age bias, where people as they get older, they don't kind of put up with getting older anymore. So I think we've got a good population for that as well. So a, co a couple of things I think I'm hearing you say, number one, it, depending on the supplement, that supplementation doesn't necessarily make expensive urine. Correct. Uh, okay. Uh, and I certainly thought that uh, early in my career, and I certainly don't think that now because I can measure the effects of supplements in people and uh, like you can, and you, you can document what happens. Correct. The second thing is, okay, so I need plasmalogens and you say it's pretty hard to eat them uh, because my stomach acid is going to do it. But there are, there are tons of phospholipids. You mentioned choline and many of my colleagues in neurology like Dr. Bredesen and Dr. Perlmutter certainly think there ought, ought to be a lot of choline in our diet. Maybe we should be eating egg yolks right and left. And yes. my, my colleagues in cardiology go, oh my gosh, choline is the worst thing that you can eat because your gut bacteria are going to make TMAO out of it, which is one of the most lethal compounds for your blood vessels. So you got to stay away from phospholipids because bacteria eat them and make horrible stuff. So, so what say you? Can help us out here. Well, phospholipids are critical. Choline is absolutely critical. It's one of the most undiagnosed or underdiagnosed deficiencies. Virtually all liver cancers, pancreatic cancer, liver diseases are associated with fossil alcohol deficiencies. So I'll be presenting a bunch of work of a large, over a thousand person study in Chiba Prefecture, Japan on pancreatic and colon cancer in two weeks in Japan. And fossil alcohol deficiencies are a major association with those cancers. And the level of choline in your blood correlates with your uh, tumor improvement in pancreatic cancer, for example. Choline is absolutely critically important. And it's important because we used to consider choline a non-essential nutrient because technically your body can make it. It makes it from ethanol. But the energy it requires to make it is quite demanding. And so it's a, it's a major driver of blood homocysteine levels. So I'm, I'm a big, big believer in choline. Now you can argue which is the best bioavailable source, whether you get lysidocholine or alpha glycerophosphorocholine or dietary choline. And those are really good questions and arguments because they are metabolized differently. When you take egg yolks, for instance, those molecules get metabolized by the upper pancreatic lipase in your upper GI. So you get lysophosphorocholine. And phosphorocholine is another really critical molecule because it's what you bought, your liver uses to make LDL cholesterol. If you can't get cholesterol circulation, and IV phosphocholine therapy has been shows amazing results in cardiovascular disease for reduction in atrioplastic plaques, um, improvement of cholesterol transport mechanisms. So yeah, phosphocholine is absolutely something you don't want to be deficient in. And creatinine, uh, creatine is another one. So your methyl transferase system is something that we, you know, we all, everyone knows homocysteine elevation is a bad thing for cardiovascular disease and for Alzheimer's. But most people don't realize why. And the reason why homocysteine is such a good marker is it's usually a biomarker of choline deficiencies. Um, because if you are choline deficient, your body is trying to make a bunch of choline, and that happens in the brain as well as in the liver, and homocysteine is a byproduct. So long answer to your question, I'm a big believer in choline. You can have an argument over which is the best type of supplement. The the pure cholines or the alpha GPCs, those get absorbed without any gut digestion. But the phospholipid versions, um, they have to undergo some level of digestion in gut or in body absorbs. All right, good. I'm glad I asked. All right, a follow up with that. So, um, how can I or how can my listeners? What foods can my listeners eat to get their plasmalogen levels up? Is there any way? Not really. The only other sources have negative, like there's supplements out there, there's biological sources of them, they're biological extracts, and usually they have very, very small levels, like a milligram or a few milligrams. And like I mentioned, your blood supply is like a thousand milligrams. So you can just imagine, you're just, you're adding a thimble full of plasmalogens into a 
to a, to a, a swimming pool size pool. And so you're not really making a big impact. Um, the natural sources are like shark liver oils will have some, but they have the negative consequences of the squalene and, and depending on the saturated size. This is where the scientifically designed side group is important. So we manufacture two types of plasma algae precursors. One is the omega-3 DHA. It's 100% omega-3. And it is pre-packaged with the omega-3 on the phospholipid backbone, on the SN2 position. It goes directly in. It's the only bioavailable source of plasma algae precursors that way. And that goes directly into your neuron cells for membrane function. And then we have a program GLIA, which is an omega-9 plasma algae precursor. And it has 100% oleic acid. And it's designed specifically for the white matter of the human body. And it's very potent anti-inflammatory um, mechanisms, especially in autism and multiple sclerosis. And so that's the, the unfortunate thing is that they're, they're in the natural world. That's why they're, these are natural supplements. Okay, so what we basically take is a scary what's naturally found in very small percentages in, say, a shark liver oil, and we create a pure, high-dose um, molecule that is designed for specific purposes. Um, so people can get confidence that what they're taking, um, they know what they're taking, and um, that's kind of where we're at. So it's, it's a, the plasmalogen story is kind of one of those. It's how to get enough of them. So is that, uh, I, I'm aware, and I don't think our readers or our listeners are aware, a uh, Japanese study used plasmalogens uh, derived from scallops uh, in, in treating mild cognitive impairment. Correct. And uh, uh, that you know, study was successful. And, uh, so uh, there are, were these, are those the sort of plasmalogens that you're talking about, or is that a totally different animal? Totally different. So that's the fully intact plasmalogen fossil of it. And that's what gets metabolized by an enzyme called fossil lipase A2 in the pancreas, uh, in the upper GI tract. And so you get your lyso fossil of it. And the, the important thing about plasmalogen supplementation is being able to deliver the right plasmalogen for the right purpose. And so, yes, if you take plasmalogens from any source, um, you're going to take enough of them over time, they'll have an effect. Okay, absolutely. And so that's great news. The challenge we have to do for the scientific community is do larger studies. We have a trial going on in Santa Monica right now. We just did a trial in, in Osaka that I'll be talking about. But ultimately, what's nice about the program that we have now is that large numbers of people can take these products. They can measure their own blood. They can measure their own phenotypic observations. And collectively, we're going to start generating large amounts of actionable health information. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. So yeah, so plasmalgins can be from other sources. And eventually, you know, obviously, um, you know, if you can get them from, you know, enough from another source, it works. But the animal extract process is never 100% accurate. And our system doesn't have any you know, um, environmental contaminants because we, we use a 100% vegan process. So we, we, gen we get our omega-3s from an algae source and we get our omega-9s from a, from a plant source. And those are source of the, of the fatty acid, of the essential fatty acid for And we purify that first from the natural source. And then we can connect it to the plasma algae backbone. So what you get is 100% vegan um, fully purified product that has no risk of environmental contaminants or plant-based um, products or, or animal-based products. It's not, it's not actually extracted from an, a, an animal source. So gotcha. that's, that's the process that we've, we've got. And that's what we've, that's what we've used to test in all of our preclinical structure activity relationships and all the research and science that's, that's behind us. So. All right. So um, one last question. Uh, I, my medical practice uh, has a lot of uh, Medicare, a lot of insurance-based practice, and you know these, sup these supplements are, are expensive. Um, so why, why are they so expensive? Uh, obviously, I, I want you and other people to, to make a living, uh, but is it the 
Is it the extraction process? Is it the formation process? It's a little bit of everything. It's the labor, the, the volume of the manufacturing process. Um, I feel exactly the same way you do. I, um, one of my favorite collaborators, Dr. Bennett from Rush University, says the best the best um, preventative has to be as safe as water and just as cheap. <laughs> okay, and 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 that's kind of where we have to ultimately try to get towards to this ability. So we've been able to systematically improve our manufacturing, improve our volumes, and my number one priority is to get this down into a price point that can be largely distributed because this is something everybody should have access to period and i think as we handle this both from the private pay perspective so people can just pay for it and we'll bring the cost down as quickly as we can in our in our manufacturing but also from the bottom up perspective in the sense that as we run more and more clinical trials and we we establish scientifically credible evidence of outcomes but not from a drug perspective from an actual supplement perspective. And this is what our universities and our government funded research should be doing. They shouldn't be in the business of pharmaceutical drugs. They should be in the business of looking at off patent molecules or natural based medicines, even the aspirin studies and so on and so forth, right? So that people can get bent in the population as a whole. The public should benefit from all of this patented research that's been done. Because once those patents expire, they're supposed to be available for public use. And for public use, that should be our academic resources should be studying these things and making them like, you know, getting aspirin at Walmart. Okay, you don't need a prescription for that stuff, right? It's cheap enough. And so as we get better and better at things, um, these really targeted supplements should be able to get to that point. And then industries really generate sustainable revenues through the service side. Okay, servicing customers, helping them with their blood test, explaining what to do. So you can pay for your time, you can charge for your services, you can charge for this, but have some sort of common interest in the underlying science of these supplements. So I think we'll eventually get there. I think we're seeing this, if you will, democratization of medicine and the people are starting to take things into their own hands. And the power of the people is pretty big. So when you get large buying blocks of individuals and as we get better information tracking, I think you're going to start seeing, you know, those shifts yep. occur yeah. because, you know, we can't ask, and you know, people get a little upset sometimes, but our current medical community is really good at acute care. Like if you get in a car accident, like you're going to get fixed. Like if I get cancer and I need tumor surgical removal, like our ability to handle acute medical needs is really, really good. And our system has worked really well to get there. But it's not really designed for this type of work. It's not really designed for preventative or this biochemical reserve concept because so we're asking, you know, a square peg to fit into a round hole. And I don't know if it's entirely appropriate for us to be, you know, forcing that on. So I think we need kind of a parallel. I think right. you're seeing anyways. Like that's why you and I are talking right now, right? Because this is, you know, People need this type of information, and they need to be able to act on it. Correct. Yeah, that's that's why I wanted you. You know, I wanted you on the show to um, highlight uh, an area that I've been fascinated with. Uh, that, I, like I say, ninety-nine point nine percent of practicing physicians have never heard of a plasmalogen and wouldn't know what to do with it if they if they saw it. I think. Um, but once they get it, it's kind of a, it's an interesting story because once people hear about it, they get a little annoyed. Because how have you not known about this thing? Like it's really it's kind of annoying that like even myself, like I'm an expert in neurochemistry and biochemical mechanisms. This wasn't even on my radar 20 years ago, and so it should have been. And so I think once you get past that that initial shock value and you say, okay, this is this is something we should be looking at, and then. The interpretation isn't that hard. If people can operate an iPhone, they can understand these blood results. So the blood results. Uh, so your uh, so how do people you know find you, find out about you? These the blood tests and the supplements have to be done through a physician order, if yes. I understand it correctly. That's correct. And so 
drgoodnow.com has much more broad-based philosophy and work that we do in cancer and cardiovascular disease and neurodegeneration. And a part of that is this plasmalgia story, which is a really, really important part. And then from there, um, Proteome Sciences does all the clinical research part. So any doctor who wants to be part of the program, wants to order supplements, wants to order blood testing, can all be done through the laboratory testing infrastructure there. Any doctor who's on full scripts can get our supplements through the formulary on full scripts. So the accessibility is pretty good. And if any person um, needs help finding a practitioner to provide them with blood testing resources or supplement resources, we can certainly direct them to individuals for that. And so we'll do everything in our power to help people get the information that they need. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I think uh, let me conclude with uh, you, you, we both kind of talked over the ApoE4 gene. And I think one of the fascinating recent findings about why this gene is so mischievous is, as you know, um, you you do you have to have phospholipids to carry DHA, DHA into the brain. And because ApoE4 Apo Apo won't make the proper carriers to get DHA into your brain. And I've been, you know. Well, I, mean, I know it was on my radar to talk to you about too, get, um, get sidetracked. But the ApoE4 story is really an amazing story. Amazing, interesting story. Because there's three main genotypes, right? There's the E2, the E3, and the E4s. And these three different genotypes have three very different um, epidemiological outcomes. Oh, yeah. And, but we're preserved. So, ApoE4, the, the number thing about ApoE4, it's all related to cholesterol regulation and transport. And it's, it's, when you're younger, ApoE4 is a very protective gene. It creates thicker, stronger membranes. So, you're resistant to parasites and bacterial yeah. infections more than the right. So, it's, it's, that's why it's genetically preserved in our population. It only becomes a problem when you get older, right? And part of this plasmalgin deficiency. So we just published a huge paper on ApoE4 showing that ApoE4 carriers that have high plasmalogens in the blood have no reduced, no increased risk of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And we did a, we did a big all-cause mortality study and showed that if you, if you corrected for the plasmalogen level in the blood and whether someone had dementia, there was no increased risk of mortality if you had an E4 genotype. So we can get this mechanistically down. And so plasmalogens have a big role in cholesterol export, your HDL system, which is the only thing your brain has. So that's where the ApoE4 thing comes in. So we have a whole podcast on ApoE4. All right, we may have Absolutely. you back with that. But I, right. Well, I'll have to come back for that one. But yeah, so All right. I love it's a yeah, very I'm sorry story. I brought it up. But no, I think this is actually really exciting because... Uh, a huge part of my population are ApoE4s, and you know we've been trying to figure this out. And you know it's work like yours, and you're right. Um, plasmalogens seem to be protective uh, against you know this gene's effect, so that's exciting. All right, well, we'll try to have you back, but thanks for coming on the program, and uh, good luck with your endeavors. Thank you very much for having me. I hope I've answered some questions, and we'll look forward to talking again in the future. All right, very good. Bye. Cheers. All right, it's time for our audience question. This week's question comes from Juan Kiko on YouTube, I hope I said that right, who asks, I wanted to ask if you care at all about phytic acid. Oh, I care so much about phytic acid. No, I'm just uh, being humorous. Uh, I have blood iron problems, and it seems that phytic acid may be to blame as anti-nutrient impairing iron absorption and other minerals. Flax seeds are on the yes list while they contain a lot of phytic acid. On the other hand, it seems important to include in the diet because of good omega-3 to 6 ratio. But flaxseed oil is neither on the yes or in the no list. Do you have an opinion about this oil? Thanks again. Well, so uh, I'm actually, for most people, a fan of phytic acid. And why is that? Well, it's because that in small amounts, in the right amounts, phytic acid can prevent iron absorption. And 
If you like the iron theory of aging, one of the theories of aging that I like, then higher iron levels associate with basically us rusting faster. And lower iron levels within normal ranges, uh, there is some very impressive research correlates with slowing the aging process. So one of the things that we can do in our diet to reduce iron absorption, which most of us get too much of in our diet, is to have phytic acid containing foods, like for instance, flax seeds. On the other hand, if you are a actively menstruating female, quite frankly, you're going to lose a lot of iron every month and that can be actually very problematic for a number of my patients. So in those cases, really, you don't want any help in reducing your iron absorption. You actually want to increase your iron absorption. So that's why you'll see flaxseed oil is neither good or bad in that uh, I take care of a large number of uh, menstruating females. And, so the other thing about flaxseed oil, since you brought it up, flaxseed oil is a rich source of a short chain omega-3 fat. And I have a lot of vegan patients who believe uh, incorrectly that they can take short chain omega-3 fats from flaxseed oil and make long chain omega-3 fats, which are DHA, DPA, and EPA. And sadly, our enzyme system is horribly designed for that. So you could take all the short chain omega-3 fats and you will really only get about a one, maybe 2% conversion of those short chain fats into long chain fatty acids, which as we were just talking about today, is what your brain has to use. So there are so many better choices uh, for oils to consume than flaxseed oil. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. So uh, yeah, if you're trying to get your iron up, uh, flaxseed oil is, is way down the list, as well as flax seeds. Okay, it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from RoboDude69 on iTunes, who writes, the most logical, educated, and constantly updated health and nutrition advice. I love that Dr. Gundry updates his thinking when he gets new research. Well, thank you, RoboDude69. Um, you're right. I am not afraid to tell you that I've learned something new that goes against what I had learned before or I had said before. And thank you for, for trusting me that when I find something that even contradicts what I said 10 years ago, or maybe last year, I'm gonna let you know. And it's based on my reading of the research, and often it's based on my patient population and what I've found that they've helped me out with. And, uh, one of these days, we'll talk about a recent paper that I presented that upends my whole idea of gluten intolerance. And uh, you'll see more of that in the coming weeks. So, great question, and thank you for that great comment. So that's all for today. We will see you next week on the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.